Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and today we're in conversation with the global CEO of Hitachi Energy who's found his way back to India for the inauguration of their new plant in Bengaluru. Claudio, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here. The last time we spoke was in Davos uh, uh, and it's good to see you here in India. Let's Thank start you. with that, Claudio. You were here to inaugurate your new plant in Bangalore. Take me through uh, the strategic importance of India, especially in the global context for Hitachi Energy today. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having us. It's, it's great to be back and uh, it's great to be back also, uh, uh, you know, in a more kind of a normal um, uh, engagement uh, with, with meeting people, customers, partners. And it was an opportunity for me to, to, uh, to participate in, in the opening of this uh, important factory. Um, it's, it's yet another step for us to uh, make sure that everything that is needed from an energy transition standpoint on the technology side and particularly when it comes to the grids uh, and how to manage the power quality, how to manage that those uh, uh, resources, renewable resources particularly, uh, deliver the electricity at the quality, at the location and at the time that is needed with more and more electrification coming on board with electrical vehicles, mm -hmm. with you know industries electrifying to clean up uh, the, the processes as well. All of that, uh, it's, it's at the center of what we do now in this new factory, which is power quality products and components and systems. All the way from uh, low voltage to ultra high voltage. It's great that we have all those competence here uh, in India as well. And the importance of the market in India, everyone of course sees uh, the importance and the relevance because of the size, because of the growth opportunity, mm. um, because also of the competitiveness mm -hmm. of, um, of this market. But for us, it's even more important strategically to support the global growth. We have out of 40,000 people that we have globally, 5,500 uh, are, are here. And about half of those are supporting the global growth from an engineering center standpoint, from a manufacturing uh, capacity standpoint as well. And, and uh, what is also very important for us is that in this energy transition, India understands well all the components, not only the generation side with renewables, with the uh, future of uh, hydrogen, hopefully green hydrogen, electrifying the demand, but also understanding what the grid needs to, how the grid needs to evolve right. in order to cope with that complexity. You know, so let me link those two aspects. One, the growth story that you spoke of and then the energy transition. Uh, what's the sense that you get from your team here in India about the kind of opportunities that you see along the road? Uh, what is the order book position at this point in time? How strong is it looking for you? What's the visibility? So uh, the, the pipeline is, is uh, strong. It's strong in India as it is strong globally. Uh, as I share with, with my team, uh, uh, I've been in this uh, part of the space for, for, for a couple of decades. I've never seen such a strong, consistent tailwinds from a demand standpoint. All driven by the same uh, uh, rationale, by the same purpose of uh, addressing that uh, carbon footprint and driving that energy transition and accelerating even that energy transition. So. Across the portfolio that we have, we, we are now seeing uh, good ten wheels uh, across also the markets, and certainly India, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those. Uh, at the same time, we all know that we also are facing quite some headwinds on the supply side that we need to also focus on to manage, mitigate uh, those, uh, uh, those risks, uh, long lead times, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. But altogether, the combination of uh, once again that mid to long term perspective of uh, having the commitment from countries like India to deliver that net zero uh, and our commitment from an innovation standpoint, from a technology provider standpoint to really help uh, partnering with uh, our customers, with all the stakeholders to help accelerate in that uh, deployment. You know, one of the concerns, and you spoke about some of the supply shocks uh, that the market is facing today. And, uh, and I remember we spoke about this as a concern when we were in Davos as well, on account of what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. Six months and the war continues now. And that is impacting the way that Europe consumes energy. Uh, who would have thought that we would see coal coming back on stream? But that is a reality, at least in the short to medium term, that uh, one is having to contend with. How do you see this impacting the transition? You said that so far there's been no impact on demand but do you believe that 
it, at least in the short to medium term, this is going to derail things uh, when we talk about the energy transition? It might. In, in uh, one or the other uh, occasion, uh, it might uh, delay decisions on, on, uh, on investments. Some of the players will have to uh, reprioritize to address the short term. And, and of course, uh, you know, the short term in certain cases uh, might be how do we go through the winter? Mm. Uh, and that, of course, is something that from a, from a social uh, perspective uh, needs to be the priority, uh, making sure that everyone has uh, uh, what it takes to go through that. Uh, that said, um, I don't see anyone deviating from the long-term goal. And, and if anything, uh, particularly in Europe, there is a clear, uh, cohesive view and consistent approach and messaging across the industry, also through the stakeholders, government, that we should not uh, jeopardize mm. that journey that we're in to decarbonize uh, uh, the energy system because of the short term. We'll have to manage priority on the short term, but the long term remains intact. Absolutely. And I think, uh, uh, you know, what is very evident, whether it's Europe or the U.S. or, of course, uh, even India, uh, the impact of climate change is visible and is evident uh, for all to see. But, you know, I, I just want to stress a little bit more on the short to medium term. And you said that this is going to be something that governments, policymakers, organizations like yours will need to manage. Now, what does that mean in terms of changes? Anything specific that you're doing differently to be able to mitigate the risks and the challenges that come up in the short to medium term, especially through this winter that is approaching? Yeah, absolutely. One, one uh, uh, concrete example is, for instance, uh, you know, in our supply chain, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, shortages that we are facing in terms of electronic components, whether it's microcontrollers, microchips, uh, and, and so on. Uh, we used to get them through a supply chain that was well equipped to manage that. Uh, uh, nowadays, uh, we have to go two, three, four tiers down in that to supply chain to understand, first of all, that those suppliers understand what the critical um, part that is in this Mm. overall mission critical infrastructure system like for instance protecting a, a power transmission line uh, and then making sure that priorities are also set uh, uh, accordingly so of course that was a learning it was a learning for us uh, but it was also learning for for the supply chain uh, uh, in, in in that respect and it's a learning that we're going through as an industry so very important in these cases which is of course is uh, it's at, uh, you know it's also crisis management in in, in, uh, in in some of those instances is the collaboration so as much as I've been uh, communicating also during uh, um, our events in, in Davos that there is no way that we can address this, uh, the scale and the speed that we need to deliver those commitments on net zero if we work the way we used to work in the past as silos. We have to be able to collaborate horizontally and even more so now to manage this, uh, this crisis. So as an industry, we need to look at this uh, cohesively. We need to you know, look at what is it that we can do um, entirely as an industry to, uh, to navigate through the short term and, and then take those learnings to uh, hopefully accelerate even further the, the long term uh, commitment that we have on decarbonizing. Right. Uh, let's move back to India then uh, and talk about the Hitachi Energy Ecosystem. Uh, you know, you talked about this new facility that you've set up uh, with an investment of uh, 100 crore rupees, I'm given to understand. Uh, you have the facility in Chennai, which is supporting your engineering services as well. Uh, so, Five and a half thousand people is what you currently have. Given the opportunity that you see here in India, not just to address the domestic market, but for India to be able to address global growth and global demand for you, what kind of future investments will you need to make? Well, for sure, we will continue to look at investments to uh, uh, localize further. Uh, roughly, if you look at the entire portfolio that we have uh, globally uh, as Itachi Energy, 80% is already localized. Uh, uh, the last step uh, in that uh, was uh, what we inaugurated uh, yesterday on the power quality. But of course, there are other uh, parts of the portfolio and technology that we continue to, uh, uh, to, to invest on globally. And because, as I was saying before, India, it is today already a central part of our global strategy, but even more so looking at what we need to deliver 
for that energy transition, for that technology to be deployed, India will become even more important in, in that role, playing a role to help supporting this growth on, on global scale. We're looking at what is it that we do today to make that 80%, maybe 100%, but also expanding around that portfolio, expanding, as I call it, at the edge of our core, which is the grid, because we need to better understand the needs of our customers when they electrify transportation, when they electrify their processes on the industry side. We need to better understand also these complementary uh, sources of energy, clean energy, such as hydrogen. And, and uh, we're, we're, we're working on that globally, but certainly looking more and more into, uh, into how India can uh, contribute to that global uh, uh, growth and that transition. So what would the opportunities on the edge of the grid uh, uh, look like for you here in India? And you spoke about some of the emerging technologies. I mean, India has also launched a green hydrogen mission. We've got the first installment of that being released by the government. There are several large conglomerates who've already uh, put together their plans of entering this space. Are you in active conversation with anybody here in India uh, to take the green hydrogen story forward? Uh, we have announced uh, just recently uh, um, a, a partnership and, uh, and, uh, and signing a uh, memorandum of understanding in Europe uh, in, in a venture, uh, H2 Green Steel, that will uh, develop technology leveraging green hydrogen to produce green steel. And of course, we're there not for the process of the hydrogen nor for the uh, producing steel. That's not our core competence, but our core competence is to make sure that we understand what we need to do to integrate mm that generation and that production into this electrical energy system of, uh, of the future. And then, of course, we took that first step uh, in, in Europe, but we're looking forward to uh, uh, expand that. And there is no, re uh, there is no doubt that in, uh, in India, all those components have been, uh, are being looked at, but also factored in in terms of commitments, investments from the government, uh, from all the industry, and we certainly want to be part of that. But again, thinking about India as part of this entire global opportunity. We'll end to a short break and return with our conversation with the global CEO of Hitachi Energy on the Global Dialogue. Welcome back. You're watching the Global Dialogue and we're in conversation with the global CEO of Hitachi Energy. You talked about electric mobility and again this is an area uh, where India has placed big bets or at least set big aspirations and big goals and big targets. Where do you see yourself playing uh, in that space from an Indian perspective? Look, the plan for India is to, uh, if I well remember uh, some data points, uh, to, to, to bring or move uh, roughly 270 million people into urban areas. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, then to also then uh, uh, electrify the transportation mode, not only electrical vehicles, but also electrify the entire uh, rail system uh, in India, which is absolutely the right, uh, the right priority. In our case, uh, we look at ourselves with our core competence on uh, managing with our customers those critical uh, infrastructures such as electricity to really find solutions, technology that help, for instance, those customers integrating uh, charging infrastructure for public transportation not for the individuals and right. on the residential, but making sure that, for instance, public transportation buses can be electrified uh, in an efficient, affordable way and reliable way, and let alone, of course, the uh, electrification of, uh, of uh, rail. Uh, we have uh, a success story. Not too long ago, we have also localized uh, the traction transformers, which is a core component that we provide mm -hmm. for um, lo lo locomotives, and, and, and we look forward to uh, of course, continuing that journey and supporting that entire transport electrification uh, initiative in India. Yes, transport electrification is going to be part of many state government's plans. In fact, we're having this conversation here in Delhi and the Delhi government uh, has put a plan in place as far as electrifying public transport is concerned. But uh, any further appetite for more m and in India? Uh, look, first of all, as, as we communicate also our strategy, Touch Energy 2030, uh, uh, we want to make sure that our customers, our partners understand that we're also committing to invest. Uh, number one for us investments is organic, is an innovation. That's uh, our, our core, that's who we are. We want to keep the leadership in terms of technology. Uh, but of course, because a lot of this uh, technology is also evolving very fast, as, as you well know, in, in many areas, uh, we will use partnerships and also we will use 
inorganic investments uh, in order to uh, help us accelerating uh, uh, the, um, the deployment of some of those uh, technologies. And uh, there are some good opportunities in India. There are some good opportunities in other markets. As soon as we uh, will know more, we will be able to uh, share more with that. But once again, for us, India is at the center of that uh, of that growth. And what is really that I'm I'm really excited is is to see that uh, there is uh, one differentiator that has been there for a while, and even more so in India, is the availability of talents. Of, of there is a, a talent pool also specifically not only on the digital side mm. and everybody is, is is well aware of that but also on this energy transition there is a talent pool for power system engineers for people that can combine digital and, and energy technology uh, and, and help us in, in uh, you know innovating uh, for India and for the world you know you spoke about the need to bet on emerging technologies and that could potentially be an area of possible M&A uh, for you uh, take us through where you believe the gaps lie today what looks exciting uh, from from a potential of being able to scale those technologies up what will you be looking at from a um, IT perspective uh, we are actually in a, in a better position uh, now that we are part of the Itachi group. As you know, uh, uh, Itachi owns 80% of uh, Itachi Energy. And they've been investing tremendously on the IT and on the IoT side. We come in from an energy perspective on the OT side. We have a lot of what it takes on that one. But we now have... Uh, our partner right with us uh, that has the scale, the capabilities, the global reach to support that digitalization together with, uh, with our customers. And of course, the more we learn how to work together, the more we learn what our customers need in that digital transition, in that digital transformation journey, uh, and the more we see the opportunities then again to develop together with them organically and potentially inorganically some, uh, some areas. Once again, for us, the inorganic path is really bolt on. We want to make sure that we focus our efforts on adding that part of the technology that will help us creating a stronger, better solution, faster and, of course, more efficient uh, to our customers. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, end by asking you about the near-term risks and challenges that uh, global CEOs like you are faced with. Uh, inflation, uh, you know, decadal highs across the world at this point in time, whether we talk about the US, Europe, UK, uh, not that bad in India at this point in time, but certainly a cause of concern. Commodity prices, uh, again, we don't know how long they're going to continue to last at the levels that they are, but uh, the expectation is uh, that it is going to continue to be tight uh, when we talk about supply. Uh, and then the big R word, the fears of recession across several major economies. As a global CEO, how do you map these three risks today? Uh, as you say, look, as I was mentioning before, uh, it's, it's uh, while we are looking at uh, all the opportunities and all this tailwind that I was mentioning, particularly in our space because of the energy transition, because of the long-term commitments on decarbonizing, uh, the combination of all what you mentioned, uh, it, it, I have never seen that coming in such a, with such a strength and across uh, all the sectors, across all the geographies. Um, it, it's a challenge. And, and some of us, uh, I'm old enough uh, to go back and uh, try to remember what we did uh, in some of the inflationary periods that we had in the past. But many of us out there uh, have not seen that. So it's, it's uh, for instance, inflation at 10 percent in the UK. Uh, it's something that many of us have never uh, yeah. dealt with, and it's something new. Uh, variability and unpredictability on uncertainty on commodities, not only the cost and the mm. price, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but also the availability, the lead times that are longer than, than what we ever expected. All of that is something that uh, we need to deal with, and, and what, what, what we need to do is to make sure that we learn as fast as we can how to deal with this uh, new environment and ensuring that once again we do this not as a silos. Yeah. Uh, I won't be able to solve with my team uh, many of these problems. Take the example mm. of the power electronics uh, 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 components, uh, shortages and so on. We have to go all the way throughout uh, the, the value chain and collaborate with everyone 
in every step in order mm. to make this work. And we do more and more of that also with, with our customers and with the broader stakeholders. Mm. But what does that mean in, in, in real ways in the near term? Uh, does it mean a pause as far as expansion plans are concerned, investment plans are concerned, hiring freezes? Uh, you know, uh, given the fact that there's an uncertain environment that you are faced with today, does it change business strategy in any form or fashion? Does it put things on hold or pause for now? Uh, you will always have one of the other projects that we will have to put on pause uh, uh, because the assumptions are not and the parameters are not in line with uh, the decision we made uh, 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 under certain different conditions. But if you, once again, overall, I think we are in a lucky position because we have the demand supporting. So we are in a growth pattern. We are hiring uh, in, uh, in India. We're hiring globally. We're hiring talents and engineers that will help us in delivering all the commitments that we've been making uh, to our customers and the trust that our customers have put uh, on, on us. But at the same time, uh, we need to be careful. We need to be selective. We need to understand also how do we take uh, those uh, commitments, ensuring that we don't uh, miss in delivering on, yeah. on those commitments. And that is the, the aspect. It's, it's not so much about uh, growth is not an issue today, mm. and we're lucky uh, to be in that position. But we need to make sure that we uh, do the right thing so that we can deliver on those, uh, on those commitments uh, on time, on cost and on quality as we always do. Well, it's good to know that in the mix of problems, demand is not one of them that you're facing a challenge with at this point in time. Claudio, we wish you and your team the very best of luck, not just with your plans here in India, but globally as well. And we look forward to seeing you uh, soon uh, and, of course, back here in India as well. Thank you so much uh, for having me for your time and look forward to be back in India. Soon. Appreciate your time. On that note, it's time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Thanks for watching.